Hi, Alan Stratton from Meswood Turns. Frequently when I am preparing for a club demonstration or a remote IRD, I like to do a dry run. That's the case here. They, they requested that I do my faux sea urchin ornament, which I really like. In this case it is made of walnut and applewood and you can actually see through and see into its soul of this. So they get the long demonstration with questions and answers and full. You get the short version. That'll be okay. But remember, the ornament challenge is coming up in November. I hope this can spark some ideas for you. Just send us your favorites into the ornament challenge. So remember that all happens in November. So we'll see you then. I'm starting with a cylinder 2.4 inches in diameter and about 3 inches long mounted between centers, though it is walnut. Using the two simple formulas from the octagon method, I'm marking the corners, midpoint, and opposite end of the octagon. Do you remember the formulas? For review, 0.293 times the diameter for the distance between the cylinder end and a corner of the octagon, and 0.414 times the diameter for the length of any side of the octagon. But wait, I need one more mark. This time the size of the side on the top of the cylinder. Now for the opposite end of the cylinder. There is extra wood here. Instead of marking in a circle, I am wasting off most of the wood before cutting a tenon whose diameter is the length of the octagon side and equal to the circle I made on the top. These are equivalent to each other. They will help me cut the top and bottom corners of the cylinder to form the octagon, which is what I do next with the spindle gouge. I work gradually siding to the circle mark on the top to the line on the side of the cylinder. The bottom end is the same except that I aim for the corner of the octagon. Voila! An octagon. Now for the sphere that is hiding inside. Split each side in half and then half again, at least for each visible side. Then trim off each corner before rounding off the sphere by eye. This will be good enough for this project. Normally, for a sphere, I would cut off the tenon. This time, however, I can use that tenon to mount the sphere in a chuck for a bit longer. This enables me to use the indexing on the chuck to mark eight divisions at the equator line. Then I can center punch each mark before drilling each to the center with a small, about one-eighth diameter bit. While the sphere is still mounted, I can drill with a three-quarter inch Forstner bit halfway through the sphere. In addition, I measure my small jaws and mark for a very shallow tenon on the sphere. I considered hollowing some now, but that was a mistake. I still need the interior bulk. Next, I flip the sphere around into the small jaws using the shallow tenon I just cut. Now I can part off the tenon and drill the three-quarter inch hole the rest of the way through the sphere. Now I swap the drive center to the smallest that I have. This is 3 8 inch. If I did not have this drive, I would use a 3 quarter inch that still fits between the upcoming fins. Now the sphere is mounted using the holes I drilled at the equator line just a bit ago. After marking halfway between the holes, I cut a flat between the marks. Then switch to a parting tool to cut about 3 8 inch deep. After cutting half the globe, I'm happy with the depth and use tape to mark the depth 
on the parting tool. Then finish cutting the cove. With the center drilled out, this is intermittent cutting, but not too bad yet. Now to rotate the sphere to mount in the holes that are now in the bottom of the cove. This is why they were drilled earlier and not simply penciled in. Similarly to the first cove, cut to the depth with a parting tool and then cut the cove. This cut is a little more intermittent because the first cove is now also an air cut. My small drive center tends to drill into the wood, requiring me to keep cinching up the live center. This is only a minor irritation. Now it gets even more interesting. The mount is back on the sphere's surface. No marking this time. I use the previous edges as my guide. Even more air to cut this time. My objective is to make each cove the same depth. I can assess this at the original top and bottom of the sphere. This is the final rotation and back into the bottom of the previous cove. I do my best to equalize the cove and minimize any flat at the top of the emerging fins. This is a delicate balance. Those eight holes were good for the previous turning, but now they are too small. I made a jig to support the wood while I drill a 5 8 inch hole to enlarge each of these eight holes. The jig is a simple support. The center dowel is 3 quarter inch to match the center hole. The center dowel is in two parts with a 3 8 inch dowel between them to keep the larger dowel aligned and allow it to split for mounting. I spared no expense since it is made from chipboard. At this point, if this were green wood, I would allow it to dry thoroughly. Now being very thin, it should only take a week or two. Using a high-speed rotary tool and rotary rasp, I start carving. Each hole is enlarged to an oval and the wood at the center removed. Any fin that still had a flat or other defect can be lightly touched and improved. After the carving, I sand starting with 80 grit and up through the grits. But sanding is only to make it look decent, not perfection. This is simulating an organic shape, a sea urchin shell. There are imperfections that are perfectly acceptable. For the shell, I chose malted oil since it is easy to apply to an irregular surface. The shell portion of the ornament is complete. On to the top and bottom finials. This is an apple branch that I cut over a year ago. At that time, I sealed the end grain with Type Bond 2 and put it away to dry. Nice, no cracks. There are insect holes, however. I do not know when the insects ate into the wood, but no problem. I cut all that away and end up cutting a tenon. Now I can start with the top finial. The first task is to cut and fit a tenon to the hole in the walnut faux, faux sea urchin shell. This is typical tenon cutting. Cut, test, cut, test until a fit. Then I shape the short finial and part it off. In retrospect, I should have sanded it before parting it off. Oh well, I will manage.
Now for the bottom finial. I like to have live center support. My skew is my preferred tool for thin finials. I can use it for rough peeling cuts to waste off wood and shear cuts that leave a very smooth surface that requires little sanding. The only shape I have to use a spindle gouge for would be a tight cove. This time I sanded the finial, then used wire to burn some accent marks against the very pale wood. After a little touch up sanding at the burn marks, I apply shellac friction polish, then part off the finial. The tenon for the urchin hole fits my long nose jaws. With this mount, I can finish the freshly cut end and apply shellac here also. Remember when I forgot to sand the top finial? Now is my last chance. Again, the tenon fits my chuck while I trim the end, drill for the mounting wire, sand, and apply shellac. I do have to pull the finial partly out of the jaws to sand and finish the final edge. It is not quite centered, but no one will ever notice, even a fellow woodturner. Before assembling the ornament with CA glue, I blackened the exposed end of the tenon. That completes my wood sea urchin. The walnut shell and apple finials go well together. What will you do for your entry to this year's ornament challenge? Mine is disqualified since I'm a host. The challenge then needs your ornament. Please give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe on my website because my notifications are more reliable than YouTube's. Please tell your friends about my weekly videos. I appreciate your comments and questions. Please wear your full face shield whenever the lathe is running. This is my best safety tip.